God bless you for being here as we continue our studies in the book of Colossians. I love these prison epistles. Uh, they, to me, have so much that uh, are so important to uh, our lives. And as Paul was addressing uh, these doctrinal issues, and uh, I was just reading today in an article that I was reading that so much in this day and time that you and I are living in, so many of uh, the friendly seeker churches, as the article was saying, uh, that so many churches are not preaching doctrinal issues. Therefore, many young people are growing up not understanding the true doctrinal issues of the Word of God. And therefore, it's easy for them once they go off to colleges and universities where liberalism is propagated and that many of them uh, will fall by the wayside because they are not getting the doctrinal teachings of Scripture by Scripture that they so desperately need. When we come to the book of Colossians for this evening, once again, Paul in a Roman prison, he's writing. We got down to verse 9 uh, as of Sunday evening. That's where we'll begin tonight. Remember that chapters 1 and 2 are doctrinal issues. Epaphras was the minister to the church at Colossae. And in that world, some 2,000 years ago, there were heretics that were out there, just as there are in our days, just as there are cults in our days, just as there are mystery false religions out there in our world today. And Epaphras uh, had gone to Rome to see uh, Paul and to share with him some of these uh, heresies that were being propagated and uh, the danger and the fear of what it might do in the church. And uh, so Paul writes this letter. And in these first two chapters, he brings forth these doctrinal issues. And even though when we looked at the book of Ephesians, Ephesians is all about the body of Christ, the church. Philippians is the church walking through life uh, sharing what the church is about, being what the church is about, doing what the church is about. Then when you come to Colossians, it is Christ is preeminent. He is the head of the body. You and I are not the head of the church. No one other than the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Now, when you come to verse 9, and following, I don't know how far we'll get this evening, but where we leave off, we'll pick up on Sunday evening. But what Paul is doing, he gives an incredible prayer here to the Colossian Christians. And he says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it. Now, the we there, he's speaking, if you'll notice over in the greeting in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. So he says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it. He's speaking about all of the things he's heard about these uh, saints and what's going on there. Do not cease to pray for you. Sunday evening I mentioned specifically the importance of prayer. You and I can never pray enough. Uh, we, we are to, as Ken sang a few moments ago, his way, mine. That ought to be the prayer that each one of us have in our life. It's his way that should be our way. Now, as Paul mentions these things that he is praying specifically for, I mentioned Sunday evening that uh, the book of James tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Notice what he says. Do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with. This is one of his petitions. This is one of the supplications that he is interceding for this church and for these saints that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. The knowledge of his will. Well, knowledge and wisdom, where do they come from? They come from God's word. They come from God. 
And so he's praying, first of all, for their knowledge, for spiritual wisdom, for spiritual knowledge, for biblical knowledge, uh, to know right from wrong, to know truth from error, to know truth from heresy. And so he's praying that they are filled. To be filled means, uh, to be filled with the Spirit means each day in you and I let the Holy Spirit control every area of our lives. He's praying that these Christians are filled with the knowledge of his will, not someone else's will. Uh, they not bow to any human being, to any man, but that they are steeped in the knowledge of the will of Almighty God. He said in all wisdom, you and I can look around at the world. There is a spiritual godly wisdom that only comes from a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we gain that wisdom and knowledge through the spiritual word, which is the water that washes us, the water that cleanses us. But let me tell you, there is also a worldly wisdom out there. It is a worldview wisdom that is not of his will. And let me tell you, it's all over the world tonight. It is like a cancer that permeates uh, the social mores of the day. I read an article today just speaking about how that uh, back 30, 40 years ago, how the church felt so differently about particular issues that today, in today's society, that the mores, that means the customs, the social customs of our society has changed so drastically that what once was looked at as sin and frowned upon now are celebrated in the culture that you and I live in. So there is a worldview out there that is saying to our kids that Ella, everything, everything is just subjective. If you think it's okay for you, then it's okay. But I want you to know, according to the Bible, this is the absolute truth of Almighty God. And as Paul's writing to these Colossian Christians, he wants them to understand <clears throat> that in an arena that they were living in, in a society that was filled with these doctrinal issues, and I'll talk more about those on Sunday evening, but I mentioned last Sunday evening, one of them was called Gnosticism or Gnosticism. The Gnostics were that group of people out there. They believed that they had super knowledge uh, about salvation that only a few had. And it was only relegated to them. And uh, it was uh, a heresy that did not believe that Jesus and God were the same. That did not believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they believed that all matter was evil, then Jesus coming in flesh could not be God himself. And so you can see how that Epaphras, the minister of the church at Colossae, was vitally concerned. And so no wonder Paul lists this incredible prayer of what he's praying for. Now, as we go through, <clears throat> pardon me, some of the catalogs of the things that he's interceding for this church, <clears throat> I would hope this would be the prayer of each one of us here tonight, that we would pray, Lord Jesus, let all of those who come through New Hope Baptist Church West, let them be filled with the knowledge of your will, God's will. In all wisdom, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, I don't know about you, but the very moment that a person is born again, regenerated, through the blood of Christ, that very instantaneously, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, the third person of the Godhead comes to operate in our lives. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit brings comfort to us. The Holy Spirit enlightens us 
and leads us into all truth. The Holy Spirit interprets the word of God for us. The Holy Spirit is a convicting thermometer in our lives, if you will, in order that when we do something, we know it's either right or wrong. When we hear something that is being taught or preached or spoken about in our world, that we would be able to know the truth of what the standard, the Bible of God's inspired holy word has to say. And so in this prayer, he is very, very fervently praying. He's effectually praying. He's not praying in generalities. How many of us in our prayer life just pray in general? Lord, bless all the people of the world. Lord, give me a good night's rest. I'll see you in the morning. Don't many of us, don't we find ourselves, I found out that the times that you feel the most weary, the times that you feel the most tired, the times that you feel the most exalted, exhausted is to pray. So oftentimes we just pray in generalities, Lord, I know you're sovereign over all, therefore I know you're in control, therefore I'm just going to bed because he that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, according to the Bible. So if you're going to stay up, I'm going to sleep. You know, that's the way we pray so oftentimes. Our prayers are so shallow. But you see, when we pray with fervency, when we pray effectively, when we pray effectually, when we have specifics rather than generalities to pray for, how much more our prayer life is, uh, comes to fruition because we are praying in the will of God. My prayer, like Paul's, would be for all of the people that come through New Hope Baptist Church West, those that visit, those that are a part of its membership, those who come through the doors. Let me tell you, my prayer is, God, help us to be filled with the knowledge of your will, of your will, not of this world's will, not of the social customs and the mores of the day that have changed so drastically in the last 40 years. But Lord, what is your will? You're still the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You are the immutable God. You do not change. Aren't you grateful that he's a changeless God? Aren't you grateful tonight that he is an omnipotent God that's all powerful over all of creation, over all of his universe, both above and below? He is God. He's creator over all. I'm grateful for his omnipotent power. I'm grateful for his immutability that he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heaven and earth, the Bible says, will pass away, but his word will never pass away. And as Paul prays here in verse 9, he is so concerned, he's so burdened. You would think in a Roman prison where he is shackled, where he is confined, where he, you would think, because if it were most of us, I'm confident of the fact that in our human fleshly existence, most of us would be concerned about us. Paul put aside himself and he began to intercede on the behalf of these Christians. If the New Hope members would intercede, that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. The immutable God, the changeless God, he's never changed that commandment. He's never changed any of his commandments. And holy writ here. 
And so spiritual understanding teaches me that in the world that I live in today, there are all kinds of lies being propagated out there in the media. And there are people that just assume because it's written out there in that print that it must be authentic, that it must be truth. Let me tell you, when you study the Word of God, when you are filled with His knowledge of His will, when you and I are filled with spiritual enlightenment, spiritual understanding, you see, that's what the Holy Spirit does. It enables you and me to spiritually discern the times that we are living in. Spiritually to discern what is right, what is wrong, what is truth, what is error, what is his will. Let me tell you, one of his will is to walk humbly before thy God. And let me tell you, as Paul prays and as he intercedes, I want to challenge you and me tonight. I want to challenge us as a church and those of our church family that listen in to this live stream broadcast or pull it up to re-listen to it at some point. I want to encourage every one of us that are intercessors, that are prayer warriors, that this prayer that Paul prayed for the Colossians might be the prayer that we would pray for the New Hope membership. Let me tell you, when we become less focused upon us, and we become more focused upon his will and his direction and spiritual knowledge and spiritual discernment and spiritual enlightenment, that this church would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom, in all wisdom, being able to know how to use the knowledge of his will. You see wisdom, you could be filled with knowledge. You could be like Ken Jennings on Jeopardy, who won for 72, I believe, straight days before he was knocked out of that position. You can be filled with all kinds of knowledge, but yet not have wisdom. Wisdom is being able to put that knowledge to use according to God's purposes and God's plans. And so as Paul prayed in that verse 9, there is so much that you and I can take that one little verse and we can unpack that to see what was ever present upon his mind as he was confined and rather than crying, rather than pouting, rather than being self-focused, Paul chose, and let me tell you, it's a choice, folks. It's a choice. We can be bitter or we can be better. And the choice becomes ours. We get to choose which it is. Do I become bitter as I look around at all of the things that I see in my world that are ungodly, that are unbiblical? Do I look around and say, oh God, Fill us with all knowledge of your will in all wisdom to be able to take the knowledge of your word, to be able to apply it and to use it with all spiritual understanding. Let me tell you, Paul realized when he had gotten word of this church and these saints and that even though he was praising God, his, his prayer is one of praise, it's one of thanksgiving but it's also one of intercessory prayer, reaching out to make supplication for these Christians. And if there ever was a time, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents in church, that we need to pray for our children and our grandchildren and our youth, it's today. Let me tell you, many of us grew up in a different period of American history when things were far different than they are today. Let me tell you, if we don't teach them the basic doctrinal instruction of God's word, uh, word of absolute truth versus a secular subjective truth, you see what the world looks at, it's what's relative to the world. 
Well, time has changed. Things that once were are now antiquated, out of date. You see, that's what the world would have us to believe tonight. I can promise you that if you and I tonight happen to be transplanted in a third world country, perhaps in Africa or somewhere where there are millions that have never heard the gospel. If you and I could be transplanted tonight over in China where churches have had to go underground because of the government and the church there, you can only do in China communist China, what the government will allow the church to do, and it's all based upon the government. If you and I were transplanted where some of those persecuted Christians are being persecuted today, and I don't want to quote a statistic because uh, statistics seem to run differently with different things that you read, but I heard the other day that there are millions of Christians every single day that are being persecuted for their faith. Let me tell you, you and I ought to be praying like Paul prayed, not only for our church and for to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual discernment, but we need to be interceding for the missionaries around the world and for those that are giving their lives in martyrdom for the faith. Paul was concerned about this church. Paul realized that it wasn't long till after the church was birthed there in the book of Acts until Satan reared his ugly, divisive, deceptive, murderous head to try to infiltrate the church with all kinds of heretical teachings and all kinds of false mystery religions. Let me tell you, in Paul's day, as in the 21st century that you and I are presently living in, we are seeing the landscape over America change. We are seeing that many of our freedoms are being swept away from us much more rapidly than any of us can ever remember. Let me give you, for instance, how many Christians really stood up when Madeline Murray O'Hare had prayer taken out of the school system? Instead of Christians standing up, you know what? Instead of our faith arising, we let fear infiltrate our hearts. And we allowed that to happen. We, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. And so as time is going on and as we see all of these things taking place in our present day society, if we as Christians do not stand for the truth of the word of God, then we're going to see more and more of those things swept away from us. Paul realized this church could be in a situation of dire trouble. He realized this church was experiencing some of those false mystery religions that were creeping into the church and that some of those that had turned to a faith in Christ, that some of those would be challenged on their doctrinal stance of the deity of Jesus Christ, the preeminence of Christ and his position that many of them would probably lay aside their newfound faith and would infiltrate back into the culture and to the society and to the false God worship and idolatry that was prevalent in the Roman Empire. He prays in verse 9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease, do not cease to pray for you. Tonight, I want to close just with that one verse and ask each one of us, is it important enough that we cease not to pray for this church, for this body 
of believers to be filled with all knowledge in his will, with all wisdom and spiritual discernment. I challenge each one of us here this evening that that be the takeaway, that that be the application that we apply to this verse, that we apply to our lives, that we apply, apply to our prayer lives. You know, one of the old time preachers <clears throat> was known as Old Camel Knees. Old Camel Knees. The reason he was known for that was because of his prayer life. Consistently, he prayed. And I believe if the church, if there's anything, anything <clears throat> that scares Satan tonight, it's when the church prays like we've never prayed before. And that would be the heart cry as Paul's was to the saints at Colossae. That is the heart cry of me to challenge each one of us that we would be interceding to the Father for his children. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you stand as we pray together? Father God, as we look at this wonderful, incredible prayer when Paul's confined to prison, that his focus, his perspective rose above his happenstance. God, that he was more interested in those Colossian Christians, those Ephesian Christians, those Philippian Christians. Oh God, how his heart's cry, the battle cry for him was to be so challenged and to be so fervently moved. Oh God, that he would become the great intercessor that he was. And I pray, oh God, that would be the heart cry of New Hope Baptist Church West. Father, thank you for these good people. Thank you for your good church. And God, may we always use spiritual discernment and be filled with the knowledge of your will. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight.